Hello everybody. So uh, we started off talking about uh, differences between different types of microscopy yesterday. Uh, we were lo looking at uh, typical techniques of microscopy that are available and uh, in general uh, what are the major um, aspects that you can actually observe with different kinds of techniques. Okay? We also saw what the uh, uh, reasons for doing different types of microscopy were. Uh, that is what kind of answers can you get with different types of microscopy. We also looked at primary differences between the techniques in terms of uh, optical microscopy, scanning electron microscopy and transmission electron microscopy. And uh, then we talked briefly about specimen preparation for microscopy which I stated uh, is very crucial in the uh, process of actually getting yourself a good image from the microscopic uh, technique. So there are several aspects involved in terms of uh, polishing specimens and porous building materials and also sometimes you can prepare materials specifically for the purpose of using for microscopy. Uh, we also looked at some cases where loaded specimens could be used and you can actually preserve the structure under loading by using an appropriate epoxy that is able to encapsulate and impregnate the porosity and the cracks to ensure that the cracks do not close after unloading. Uh, we talked about certain additional aspects of specimen preparation, one is uh, etching. Etching is basically selective chemical attack which exposes certain phases and exposes the grain boundaries in a much better fashion than if you do just polishing. And finally, we talked about coating which is uh, recommended for samples that are non-conductive uh, because in non-conductive samples when you use it in a scanning electron microscope, the electron beam tends to charge up on top of the specimen because there is nothing to conduct the beam down towards the rest of the metallic parts of the microscope. So this charging is not very good for imaging. So because of that, we need to have a conductive surface which is typically obtained by sputter coating uh, by an, ele an el element like carbon, chromium or gold palladium which can be up, uh, uh, applied as a layer on top of the specimen to ensure that the star surface gets conductive. All right, so moving on to the next aspect. So let us start discussing now the aspects of optical microscopy. Now this is something that many of you are familiar with because you have probably used microscopes in your school days. The idea is to involve, uh, to use the assessment of uh, the specimen by passing visible light transmitted through or reflected from the sample depending upon how the sample is whether it is transparent, translucent or opaque in which case in one case you may have to rely on through transmission uh, uh, light microscopy in other cases you may have to work with reflected light microscopy. So idea is to allow a magnified view of the sample and the resulting image is either detected directly by the eye or can be captured photographically, right. Now it is quite similar in some ways to your principles of photography. In photography also you are actually looking at an object and you are trying to capture the image of the object on the camera. And today of course with all the sophistications that you have in the cameras uh, like an optical zoom or a, a digital zoom, you can actually lead to uh, magnified views of the object in many ways quite similar to what you actually do with a microscope. Of course, you cannot get to the resolution of the microscopes, but you can certainly get somewhere close. All right, so again just to uh, make you remember the visible light spectrum, please remember that the white light is composed pr principally of seven colors. You all know that quite well, the rainbow colors and these are distinguished by their wavelength. So if you look at the visible light spectrum, we are basically in this range. So you have violet, indigo, green, blue, yellow, orange and red, okay. Sorry, violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange and red because that is the order of the wavelength. So which has the smallest wavelength? It is the violet light has the smallest wavelength and red has the largest wavelength which is close to about 700 nanometers, okay. So, what is also given in this chart which is probably not that clear to look directly on the screen, uh, you may actually see it in the uh, uh, directly in the slides that uh, these are actually uh, the discharges produced by different types of metals. For example, you have here ca copper vapor which can produce a wavelength in the range of about the green light, okay. So uh, several elements actually emit radiation and that is in the range, in the visible range in some cases. For example, here you talk about helium and neon, they are releasing it in the red wavelength, okay. So this is just to give you an idea about what are the different categories of wavelengths and what kind of characteristic emissions from metals correspond to those wavelengths, okay. So 
if you look at the basics of light which is something you might have learnt in your high school physics you know that light can be absorbed refracted reflected diffracted dispersed or scattered and you also know that light has a dual nature we discuss often about the particle nature of light as well as the wave nature of light okay as a particle it vibrates in all directions as a wave it's got a well defined characteristic wavelength and so on what are these characteristics that we are talking about absorption you all know very well is when you try try to transmit light through a medium or an object some amount of that light get gets absorbed by the medium okay so what might happen is based on the characteristics of the medium some specific wavelengths from the light may get absorbed so because visible light has several wavelengths based on the characteristics of the material it can absorb probably let's say blue light or green light for instance and allow the rest of the light to pass through that's called absorption refraction of course change in direction from one medium to another and it depends obviously on the characteristics of the medium itself primarily the refractive index right refractive index and in general when visible light travels through a different medium the spectra of different wavelength tend to travel differently for example the short wavelengths are bent more than the long wavelengths okay uh, diffraction is a feature which happens whenever you have slits or edges which may tend to bend the rays of light so bending around the edges or when light tries to pass through a slit it tends to again bend there are some beams that go straight but there are several beams that bend okay so that bending is called diffraction dispersion on the other hand is a separation of light into constituent wavelengths upon entering a transparent medium such as your rainbow spectrum so why is the rainbow caused because dispersion of light through water droplets right dispersion of light through water droplets and you might have also done a high school physics experiment in which you take a triangular prism and then you try to actually look at the dispersion of light when light crosses this prism and of course we already talked about the dual nature of light as a wave and as a particle all right so now what is absorption so again for example if you have here white light okay a blue light implies <coughs> that you are absorbing the other primary colors that is red and green okay red light on the other hand implies that blue and green are getting absorbed right so if you have a filter for instance which can absorb these wavelengths and only transmit the red for example if it absorbs blue and green and transmits the red then you call it a red light a green light on the other hand is when you absorb the blue and red okay so essentially what's happening here for example a control spectrum has all the colors but in the case of a red filter what you're doing is absorbing the blue and green and only transmitting the rest of the colors okay so essentially absorption simply means that based on the characteristics of the material it absorbs certain wavelengths and allows the other wavelengths to pass through now something that you have learnt before again reflection and refraction so here you have an incident beam of light which goes to a different medium okay so this is a different medium part of that beam is obviously reflected and you know that angle of reflection is equal to angle of incidence okay but based on the refractive index n of the material you may have this beam which transmits through the material but in a bent fashion so this bending produces a transmitted beam angle okay and the relationship between incident beam angle and transmitted beam angle depends on the refractive indices of the two media okay so when light travels from air through glass okay air has a refractive index of 1 right and then glass may have a different refractive index so n1 divided by n2 will be essentially the ratio of the refractive indices of the air to the glass and your angle of of refraction will depend on how different n1 and n2 are okay now if you look at the velocity of light itself in a material of refractive index n it will be simply the actual velocity of light c divided by the refractive index n what is the velocity of light 3 into 10 power 8 meters per second 3 into 10 power 8 meters per second now of course uh, we know very well that uh, this law which relates the reflection angle to the incidence angle is called snell's law 
and of course, we also know that the refractive index is defined by the degree to which the light is bent on travelling to another medium which is dependent on the composition of the material. So, already we have some basis for characterization using light. That basis is simply that if different phases in a material have different refractive indices, the light travelling through these phases will be bent to different degrees, right. Also, based on the composition of the material itself, the amount by which the light gets reflected or the energy of the reflected light will also be different for different types of phases. Right? And that is something we can relate to with respect to characterization. So, that is how we will use light microscopy to distinguish the different types of phases that are present in our sample. All right, so, this is a ray diagram which is quite familiar to you probably from your uh, middle school physics. So, here you have a lens right? and then you have an object here which needs to be imaged on the other side and you know that the ray is travelling through the object go through a point in the object plane which is known as the focal point right. And of course, you also have parallel rays which go then through the lens on the other side again it passes through the focal point ok. Always the rays tend to converge on this point known as the focal point and then you form the image on the other side ok. So, this is a simple single lens setup. For example, if you use a magnifying lens you will be able to see objects on the other side which are magnified based on the property of your lens itself ok. So, this is the simplest experiment that you can do this one is called the object plane, two is called the front focal plane, three is obviously the lens plane, four is the back focal plane and five is the location where the image is formed the image plane ok. And uh, again from high school physics we know that the lens makers equation relates your focal length to the distance of the image and the distance of the object right 1 by f is equal to 1 by distance of image plus 1 by distance of object and the magnification itself is nothing but the ratio of the image distance to the object distance ok. The farther the image from the lens the greater will be the magnification ok. Now, when you observe things with a magnifying glass you will also see that in some locations you are actually getting a magnified image which is upright, but if you actually turn the magnifying glass away from your eye, you will also reach a distance where the object on the other side looks inverted ok. Quite simple experiment we must have done this several times in our childhood. When you take the image when you when you observe the eye uh, the magnifying glass very closely you will see a magnified image on the other side which is upright, but if you take it slightly further away from your eye you will see an inverted image which will not be magnified. So, that is a simple experiment you can try that out if you have forgotten it, but that is basically because you are trying to again relate it to the properties of the lens and the location of the focal point that is about it. Uh, of course, if your uh, object distance is less than the focal distance then the image will form on the same side as the object ok. If the object distance is less than the focal length your image formation will happen on the same side again uh, of course, you uh, if you can take up the school books of 8th or 9th standard children you will probably find a lot more explanations than we are actually having time to get into at this stage. All right, Then what about a microscope? A simplest microscope works with two lenses, simplest microscope works with two lenses. You have the objective lens which is close to the object and they ha you have the eyepiece lens through which you are actually viewing the object ok. So, what is happening here is that the intermediate space between the objective and the eyepiece lenses is where an intermediate image plane exists ok. So, the initial ray diagram tends to form the image here right, but then when I try to view through the eyepiece I need the image to form in my eye or if I am keeping a camera here instead of the eyepiece the image has to form in the camera right. So, the overall image is actually the one that is getting formed here. This is the intermediate image which is formed because of the single objective lens ok. So, depending upon the spacing between your objective and the eyepiece right you may be able to form images at different locations which are magnified to some extent when they come to the eye. Now, here since we are using a compound lens that is more than one lens the magnification is simply a multiplication of the magnification of the first lens and the second lens. Obviously, 
more number of lenses you have, the greater the magnification. Okay, so in this case, your magnification is simply a multiplication of the two. Now, what happens is when you have a single lens, you can actually use a range of focal lengths. Okay, because lens has no fixed position. Because if you take a magnifying glass, right, you can keep changing the magnifying glass. That's why I said that when you hold the magnifying glass close, you will actually see a magnified view upright. When you take it further away, you will see a not magnified view which is inverted. Now, that is happening because you have you are playing with the focal length and the eye itself has an adjustable focal length. Your, your eye has a muscle inside which can actually adjust and focus at different lengths. Right? I am trying to focus on the first bench here, I can also focus on the last bench. It is not the same with a specific lens which has only a fixed focal length. Okay? So, idea is simply that when you are trying to view with a single magnifying glass, you have the flexibility of changing the focal length. Okay? So, when you work in a microscope system on the other hand, you need to define the tube length which is the length or distance between the objective and the eyepiece and that is usually fixed, that distance is usually fixed. So, microscope has a specific distance which is important for recording of the image to capture the image either photo recording or video recording. Okay? And one thing that you need to also understand is because the eye has a flexible focal length that means you can actually strain your muscles or relax your muscles to change the length that you are actually trying to uh, view. When you actually observe it in the microscope, the images that are clear to the eye may not be clear to the camera that you place there because the camera has to be fixed at one particular location. Right? So, images that appear in focus in camera may appear out of focus to the eye and vice versa. The eye is the best lens possible because of the muscles that you have. You can actually adjust it to view anything, but in a camera when you set up the microscope to capture the images on a camera, you need to ensure that you adjust to the camera's focal length, not to the eye's focal length. Now, so because of this inflexibility in the objective to eyepiece distance, in most cases the old microscopes had a very clear cut distance of the object to image of 195 millimeters. So, this is the eyepiece here on top and that is the objective length system and that is your specimen which is being viewed. Okay? So, in the old microscopes these were conforming to the German standard or DIN standards. So, what happened here in this case is real image is formed at a tube length of 160 millimeters. So, this is the tube length from eyepiece to the top of the objective length objective lens that is basically your tube, the light tube which is carrying the light rays from the objective to the eyepiece. So, that, that tube length was 160 millimeters. The focal distance was set to 45 millimeters that means the from, so your intermediate image plane should capture the light coming through the objective lens at a distance of 45 millimeters. So, object image distance was set to 195. But today we have a lot of intermediate optics in the cameras or in the uh, in the microscopes which makes it possible for us to actually improve the quality of imaging. Modern microscopes do not have this fixed tube length of 160 millimeters, they have what is known as an infinity focus. Now, what do you mean by infinity focus? You have all realized this when you actually look at objects, when you try to get an object very close to your eye, right? you have to strain to read things. Now, I am not talking about uh, reading things which are far off, which are extremely small letters, but what I am saying is when you are trying to focus on something close by, it is quite difficult, it puts a strain in your eye. Right? So, here in the old microscopes, you had to focus your eye exactly at that length. Right? But now in modern microscopes, what they do is they adjust the tube with additional lenses, which makes it look as if you are peering into infinity. Now, if I am trying to focus on something very far away, an object that is extremely far away, I do not have any strain in my eye. Only when I am trying to see very close, I put my eye under strain. If I am trying to focus far away, infinity, I do not really have that kind of strain in my eye. So, modern microscopes are embedded with light tubes that have multiple lenses which makes it possible for your eye to actually focus as if it is on focusing on infinity, it is looking very far. You may actually get that sense sometimes when you actually look under the modern microscopes, 
you may you may think that you are actually viewing an object that is far off right but in reality it's right there that's all because of the intermediate optics so again this is just a graphical description of what i just talked about you have a tube length in the old microscopes tube length of 160 object to image distance of 195 and focal length of the objective lens was 45 millimeters now the real picture because you have all these compound lenses inside is like this so you have your objective lens here and you have your eyepiece lens here but all these are the intermediate lenses that are present in your tube now without really getting into the wave optics there because it's quite complicated right the idea is simply that this kind of a system which processes multiple uh, tubes inside or multiple lenses inside the tube helps your eye to relax and focus on something which is at infinity that means you are looking at an object that is quite far away and that makes it quite easy for you to look at things without straining your eyes okay so exactly generally when you use a microscope which has this fixed length you will end up with headaches and tired eyes okay so whenever you are trying to focus on a close distance you always get a headache or tired eyes but if you are focusing on something far away you do not have that problem okay which is why when you read books right people say that the optimal distance of the book should be about 25 centimeters yeah 25 centimeters they say should be the at least 25 centimeters should be the distance at which you keep your book if you try to read very close you are obviously going to be straining yourself 